And then I will show what the LTI launch looks like after the fact. So that was all the setups. Okay. So let's go back to our section here. And you see we have the, you can just click access elms. And so if you remember from before, this actually, and I just had it in for a second, uh, this took you to a form that was pre-populated, uh, indicating where you should go. Right? So if I click Access Elms now, you see I have a, a web access prompt here. I've now been routed to R20. This is the same exact link as before, and to indicate the case and show it again. So I go back and hit edit here and see this is the same link that was provided the first time. So now the link is aware of the fact that now that I click through, that's not actually where I want to end up. Right? So it's actually doing a double a double bounce if you will. Um, we can look at what that did then if we go to people here. I can see there it is right there. That's the BTO 5009 that was created on demand. Uh, you'll see it didn't give me a role of any kind because in LTI tool provider, I haven't set that up yet. Um, so let's do that again and show how that changes, right? So if this was running in production, I would say, hey, if you notice an instructor, I want to make you an instructor. If I notice a learner, you're a student. Um, if I notice a TA, you're a TA. We haven't quite gone through how the other ones will work yet. But so these are the three that we're going to interpret and allow to you know, have these roles on the main. So the other thing you can set up in LTI, LTI tool provider is uh, user attributes. And so you'll see I don't have any profile fields yet, but we can actually capture a first name, last name, things like that. We need to, we need to actually add that in. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and add the so people and fields. I believe I already have a first name. We have a first name field. Let's just use else. So quickly add a first name. You can see how easy it is to actually modify uh, different aspects of the LTI integration. Um, kudos to the group in Australia that put this together. So I'm going to add these two fields. So now these are the user profile fields effectively. Uh, if I go back to configuration and LTI tool provider and the user attributes, you'll see now I can basically route these to the right place. So we'll say person name given is first name, and then I think family name is last name. Oh, I okay, so now we'll go and we'll remove that ETO 5009. So cancel this select user account. Account, so it's gone. Okay, so there's nothing here. Now we'll go back to the other launch point, right? So we'll go, I think you know, I'm still BTO 5009, and we'll click access. And so you'll see, I still got access to this space to verify that you couldn't just do this as anyone. If we refresh this page of users now, you'll see that it actually put that one in as an instructor because it's mapped to the real 54. Um, it's probably been using test accounts, so let's delete both of these. <laughs> Technically, the real 54 is uh, it's a good pseudonym to use for testing as well. So let's try that again. Maybe access all this this time. There we go. BTO 509, you see I have additional credentials already. You can notice because I have that drop down there. Uh, if I refresh this page, you now see BTO 5009, role is instructor, created 15 seconds ago. Cool is it was created on first access. You can see it populated my first name and last name. That came across the LTI. Um, another neat thing for you know keeping data synchronized, if you will, is that it, because it's an LTI request here first, it's actually making me, you know, you see BTO 5009, it's actually adding that information locally to the CIS. So in this case, you know, there's my first name and last name. Um, so you could almost do some like CRM type of stuff if there's additional information that you want to keep about a person, you know, instructors and things like that. 
or if you, you could actually have different uh, role delegation in the CIS, maybe you know, student accounts get nothing in the CIS, but maybe instructors get some kind of staff role. Uh, in TAs, you know, it kind of just gets ignored, it creates an account so that there's a record here. Uh, but then that way, in the actual course they're in, it still creates the role in question. Uh, so the code for this is uh, mostly up on Google.org at this point. So we have the CIS code base, which is what the, the originating thing is. Um, for right now, there's just a pattern, which is um, highly common, a pattern to the, the Drush script that is going and actually doing the automation and creation of the space. Um, this will, once it's refined, it will be publicly available and it will actually ship with instructions uh, with the distribution as to how to go about setting that up, setting up the bash script that processes it. It will also include the bash script that goes through and, and turns this file effectively that the CIS is generating into something uh, that it can translate into a new site. Um, it also works against other services. So if I wanted to, right now, it's hard-coded support for the course service. Um, but in, in the future, we'll take into account in context, you know, if they're asking for the course or if they're asking for a different tool that we have knowledge of, uh, then we can pass people through to it automatically. Uh, this effectively removes the notion of setting things up <laughs> once it's done. So I'm very, very excited about it. Um, it's utilizing, you know, it's going to have initial support for the uh, MASP Open course distribution as well as something that's just here as a, a placeholder really of uh, the collaborative learning environment which is CLE which we call studio internally um, and it's part of CIS there's also um, both of them because it's being this is very important as to why it's being designed to work for multiple distributions um, actually with the way that CIS is set up and the way that LTI is set up you should be able to utilize any Drupal 7 distribution in this mechanism, um, which is another goal of the CIS, is that you could actually, you know, let's say Drupal 7 Open Atrium is released, and it's a really good project management hub, and you want students to utilize a project management hub as part of an assignment, um, we could actually add Open Atrium in, say that you know, basically the only thing that's stopping it is the course information system being turned on, um, the, you know, the connector code that knows how to talk to CIS effectively. The uh, other end is LTI. Um, so when you, you, know, you turn that on, it has all the components as to how to utilize those two pieces together to you know, pass things through seamlessly. And so it really after that, it's just manually adding to the whitelist. Um, there is a whitelist in terms of what distributions are allowed to be created for security reasons. So right now it's just you know, hard-coded as MOOC and Studio, I believe, or CLE rather. Um, but really there's very little stopping it from handling any Drupal 7 distribution. Another reason that we're setting things up this way is so that uh, eventually you know, we're not going to be using Drupal 7 for everything. Uh, and I'm very aware of that. But we will be using XML and we will be using LTI into the foreseeable future. So if this piece, you know, the description of how to talk to the CIS, as well as the LTI code base, which can be found at uh, LTI underscore tool underscore provider, as long as these are upgraded and maintained, uh, we can basically have any version of Drupal talk back to uh, the CIS in a language it understands, which is just, it's just XML and JSON. So very excited about this. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I'm hoping to talk about this more in the future in terms of uh, presentations and things like that. So.